Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot. I'm the program manager for Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today and our friends at Cherokee Health Systems for hosting today's session, Sexually Transmitted Infections Treatment Update with Dr. Hunter Hansfield. Dr. Hansfield is an infectious disease specialist, has a particular expertise in sexually transmitted diseases, HIV prevention, and other infectious aspects of sexual health. He is a professor emeritus of medicine, University of Washington Center for AIDS and STD, Seattle, and former director of the Sexually Transmitted Disease Control Program for Public Health, Seattle and King County. He has been at the forefront of STD, STD research and prevention for over four decades, and is the 2010 recipient of the American Sexually Transmitted Disease Association's Distinguished Career Award, the nation's highest accolade for STD ex expertise. Dr. Hansel is a frequent consultant of, on STD prevention and treatment for the Center uh, for Disease Control and Prevention, including CDC's STD treatment guidelines, and we are just very thankful and blessed to have him as one of our Maven Project volunteers. So Dr. Hansfield, when you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Kristen, and greetings, everybody. Uh, I'm told there's a fairly substantial uh, uh, sign-in for this, so I'm uh, happy to help. It's a broad topic. I'm going to talk fast. I'm going to do it on purpose, uh, and I apologize, uh, but feel free to take screenshots. You will have the slide set uh, 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 tomorrow. So the routine accreditation statement is uh, there, and uh, this is simply my disclosure statement. I don't have any disclosures of any significance that are pertinent to this. So I, I think you wouldn't be here, and you wouldn't be on this uh, uh, program if you weren't already basically aware of some of the things. I won't spend a whole lot of time. Uh, but the bottom line is there are a lot of STDs out there. And uh, but and by the way, minor terminology thing, I use the terms STD and STI interchangeably. I don't perceive, in fact, I have editorialized the fact I don't think anybody should perceive any difference in sexually transmitted infections versus sexually transmitted diseases. It's a personal preference. I won't go into more detail about the pros and cons of terminology, but uh, I use them interchangeably. I tend to use STD a bit more because I'm an old guy who's been in the field for a long time, I'm used to that technology. So there's a lot of chlamydia, there's a lot of gonorrhea, there's a lot of syphilis, which is skyrocketing, uh, including congenital syphilis. And um, it, these are big problems, and you know what some of the, this just illustrates some of the things that uh, can uh, result as a, uh, as a consequence. Much of what I have to say is also covered, in addition to the slides that you'll see in these two documents, uh, the the latest STI treatment guidelines from CDC from uh, uh, almost two years ago now, uh, and uh, an update to them regarding gonorrhea, update the guidelines for gonorrhea that actually preceded that. If you don't have time to pull out your phone, but you want the QR codes, don't worry, they're going to show up again at the end of this presentation. But uh, let me just say, the STI treatment guidelines is a really superb document. It's rather long. It's a couple hundred pages. But for someone who's just new to the field and, not, and needs a quick ride up the learning curve, Everything from epidemiology to clinical manifestations to uh, treatment, even though treatment is the main emphasis, it's a really good, it's a good short document, a relatively short document for reading. Okay, we're going to talk about several different modules, and we're going to start with drips and discharges. Uh, so this is where we'll talk about chlamydia, gonorrhea, mycoplasmas, NGU in men, and cervicitis in uh, women. Uh, the main, one of the main take home messages of the new STI guidelines as of two years ago is that azithromycin for chlamydia works less well than it was once thought. I was proud to be the senior author on some of the earliest studies of azithromycin efficacy for chlamydia and gonorrhea, and I loved the drug at the time. I was proud to have been involved in that. But we now know that when you look at outcomes by culture of chlamydia, uh, you miss a lot of infections uh, that are picked up by PCR, by, by nucleic acid amplification testing, not technically PCR, but same idea, uh, as currently used. And using that, that technology, we now know that, that, that azithromycin fails, uh, cures only 70 75% of rectal infections. And because uh, rectal, because rectal infection is present in up to 50% of women with, with, cervical chlamydia, even if they've not had anal sex, uh, the overall treatment failure rate in women with single doses of azithromycin is uh, in the 15 to 20% range, only 80%, 80, 85% cure rate. Still works very well in the male urethra. 
But uh, in general, uh, azithromycin is no longer recommended as first-line therapy. So it's something to make sure you keep in mind. It still has its extraordinary advantage, however, over doxycycline because of its single-dose uh, management. I think probably most of you who decided to sign into this presentation probably are completely aware of, as, uh, of the recommended regimen. So I will talk about them very quickly. Doxy, 100 milligrams twice daily for seven days. There is a 200 milligram extended release version. It can be taken just once a day. Better GI tolerance, costs more money. So pros and cons, equally effective. Uh, Doxy is so effective that there's no need for tests of cure for chlamydia unless compliance is in question. Um, the Zithro remains an alternative, so does levofloxacin. And, uh, but uh, for if, if Zithro in particular, be sure you do a test of cure and, uh, uh, and uh, it's probably a good idea. Uh, to, and in rectal, for MSM, by the way, rectal infection also uh, do a test of cure. Everybody should have delayed retesting or rescreening in a few months. Uh, not so much to detect delayed treatment failure, but because statistically, uh, if you had it once that you've identified yourself as being part of a sexual partner network where a lot of people are infected, and therefore reinfections are common. So everybody ought to get retested in the next three to six months. That's a standard CDC recommendation these days. In pregnancy, azithromycin is really, you can't use doxy, azithromycin or amoxicillin, but for those reasons we just talked about, uh, test of cure uh, always uh, when you do have to use azithromycin uh, in, uh, in pregnant women. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but there's a lot of hype and buzz on the internet, uh, mostly you know, places like Reddit and places where people can post whatever they want without regard to science. And uh, there's a lot of belief that is simply wrong about pharyngeal chlamydia. Uh, we're picking up a lot more just because when gonorrhea testing is done with the pharynx, chlamydia is always included with the standard test. So we get occasional positives, but we now know that most of those are low numbers of organisms. They go away spontaneously in a couple of weeks. They never cause symptoms. They're almost never transmitted uh, by oral sex. And so CDC does not recommend routine pharyngeal testing, even though it is commonly done because of the linkage, because gonorrhea of the pharynx is an important issue and the testing is linked and you always get a chlamydia result when you test for gonorrhea. So you're gonna be confronted with some cases and if it's positive, of course, better point of, you know, better safe than sorry. So of course you're gonna treat it if you do get a pharyngeal positive. But, uh, in general, it's something you can sort of discount as an important clinical entity in the STI realm. Uh, this shows the trends in antimicrobial resistance of gonorrhea uh, as we switch to gonorrhea treatment over the last uh, several years, uh, with azithromycin resistance being the dominant new trend. Uh, the cephalosporins remain highly, highly active and although you will see news reports of the occasional rare case of highly resistant, unquote, untreatable, unquote, gonorrhea, uh, mostly acquired in South Asia or, or the uh, uh, Western Pacific uh, countries, parts of China, Korea, Japan, uh, they're not yet present in the United States in any numbers. And it is simply a myth that there are any there is any such thing anywhere in the world of untreatable gonorrhea. There is no gonorrhea that cannot be treated with some antibiotics. And significant resistance, happily, is held at bay for the current time uh, in terms of the cephalosporins in, uh, in the United States. So the, the, main, uh, the main gonorrhea change that occurred uh, with the 2021 guidelines was to raise the recommended ceftriaxone dose from 250 milligrams to 500 milligrams IM uh, once, if someone weighs over 330 pounds, uh, give them a whole gram. Um, if chlamydia has not been excluded, that is you got someone who's being treated because they're a partner of an infected person or that they got a positive gram stain if they're male and you haven't don't yet have a chlamydia test result, you're gonna add doxycycline to cover uh, uh, chlamydia. <laughs> but if someone has been tested for both and the chlamydia result has come back negative, uh, but only gonorrhea positive, you need to give only the ceftrax. Um, when oral therapy is the only option, some people will refuse injection. In some clinical settings, practice, 
rules require uh, no injection if a doctor is not present, he isn't on site, or some such, I think, arcane requirements. Uh, or if you're treating sites using a, a explanatory partner therapy or that sort of thing, there is still important roles for oral treatment, and stifixime 800 milligrams still remains highly, highly effective. That's an increase from 400 milligrams prior to that, uh, but it's easy, well tolerated, so on. And again, if chlamydia has not been excluded, add the doxy or azithro. So remember, don't get don't get confused. Azithro is no good for gonorrhea anymore, uh, but a one gram dose is still good for chlamydia. So if you do give co-treatment for chlamydia, it can be azithromycin if someone's also giving the uh, the, the, the suffixing. Uh, Cephalosporin allergy, you can give genomycin plus azithromycin. I won't dwell on that a little bit more. High dose, so you need both. But all these, all these are less reliable for pharyngeal infection than they are for anogenital gonorrhea. Um, do keep in mind expedited partner therapy. That's the sight of the scene treatment of partners uh, when they are not available to come in for exam treatment or may not be uh, signed in. If, if most of you listening today are with Cherokee Health in Tennessee, maybe a little bit in Kentucky. Uh, and um, uh, you, you uh, uh, and perhaps, I don't know Cherokee Health's particular policy, but conceivably there are policies against EPT, but there's no legal structure anywhere. And if you have a partner who is not a Tennessee Health recipient and you can't easily prescribe for them directly, even if they come in, Use expedited partner therapy. It's really good. You just you you arrange to either prescribe or ideally to give the index patient extra drug for her partner uh, to assure that it takes it. It works better on average than asking partners to come in to treatment, and it is explicitly legal in all fifty states. I didn't I haven't checked the Tennessee laws, but uh, I'm taking that CDC statement. These two QR codes give you CDC links of, to CDC documentation about uh, these issues. I'll, in case anybody's getting their phone out and wanting to take a picture of them, I'll leave that up for another couple seconds. As I say, you'll have the slide set the next couple days, so don't worry about it if you didn't get it uh, now. So one of the newbies in, uh, in the STI world is mycoplasma genitalium. It's actually an old organism, first documented now, 30 years ago or so, but it was almost impossible to culture. And until nucleic acid application methods were readily available, we didn't know very much about it. But now we do know quite a bit. So uh, this organism is the cause of up to a quarter of NGU cases in men. Uh, it's present in a high proportion of women with unexplained, otherwise unexplained vaginal discharge, cervicitis, et cetera, lower genital tract infection in general. And it's present in a modest proportion of women with PID. Whether it's actually the cause of these syndromes when it is positive by NAT testing is not always clear. And for PID in particular, the data, uh, the, the final conclusion is still out as to how important M. genitalia really is as a causative factor in PID. No other complication has been reported. It's not been associated with epididymitis, epididymitis in men, for example. Um, it's rare in the pharynx, not commonly transmitted by oral sex, uh, not commonly transmitted by uh, rectal infection, much less prevalent in MSM, therefore, than in heterosexual men and uh, women. Most infections are asymptomatic and probably uh, remain so. We'll talk about antibiotic resistance and treatment in just a minute, but screening is not recommended in any population. There's just too much uncertainty about how important it is to detect subclinical infection. Um, that said, many labs in their, quote, comprehensive panels, unquote, for STI testing, particularly self-determined by patients just going online, are including M. genitalium now. So you're going to be confronted with patients who are test positive in whom you're gonna to have to make a decision about treatment. We'll talk about that in just a bit. When to actively test for M. genitalium, the main and most common clear clinical indication where you should have it in mind on a regular basis is in men with NGU that has recurred after prior treatment with, God, with uh, doxycycline or azithromycin. So it recurs or doesn't get better on one of those drugs and you're now two or three weeks out and they still got a discharge, maybe a little bit of dysuria and so on, 
Those are the people in whom you're most going to detect most of your M genitalium and where treatment of it potentially becomes important. The CDC talks about testing to consider testing, quote unquote, in persistent cervicitis or PID. Again, the data are sort of not conclusive of how crucial that is. Uh, I'm going to assume that most of you practice in settings where if M genitalium is identified, you're not going to know it's antimicrobial susceptibility. There is sensitivity testing is available in some labs. And if it is done, and you know that the strain at hand is susceptible to the microlide antibiotics, like erythromycin and azithromycin, then you give doxycycline followed by azithromycin in the dose shown. But most of the time, the yellow highlight is going to apply. You're not going to know, and so you're going to do doxy followed by moxifloxacin. Notice the sequential nature of this. You do not get the two drugs together. Doxycycline, it's interesting, and the biology of this is not totally understood, but doxycycline markedly reduces the organism load without actually eradicating M. genitalium and makes treatment with other drugs more successful. So in either case, either with azithromycin or usually with moxifoxacin, uh, it's a sequence. Doxy, wait a few days, start the moxy. Um, Non-genitalia mycoplasmal infections. A lot of time could be spent on this. And there's here, too, a lot of buzz that you see there, are whole Reddit subreddits about people who are talking about their urea plasma infection and the fact that it won't go away and they, and they still have symptoms and, and yada, yada, yada. These are normal genital flora. Urea plasma and mycoplasma hominis are just normal. They're present up to 50% of sexually active people in their teens to 20s. Uh, they're shared by sexual partners, but that in itself doesn't make them pathogenic. Screening is not advised. And if someone has screening, and these are offered by a lot of labs in their, quote, comprehensive panels, you can ignore a positive result. Now, if someone has otherwise unexplained vaginal discharge, and you want to you're going to probably treat that empirically anyway with doxycycline and so on, which is a good drug for these things. But you don't don't tell the patient or don't assume that just because you identified urea plasma and they've got an unexplained symptom that it's necessarily going to improve their symptoms. And you, please just don't treat those who have no symptoms and test positive. They don't need it. Um, what does cause NGU and non gonococcal cervicitis? Chlamydia, around a quarter to a third, M genitalium, 15 to 20%. A few cases of urea plasma, urea lidocaine infections are pathogenic, but it's under 5% of NGU cases. Remember the viruses do cause urethritis from time to time. So HSV and adenovirus. Uh, adenoviral urethritis following oral sex is a real thing and not all that rare, particularly in the common cold season. So this time of year, you might see it. Uh, and it, it, interestingly, because adenovirus often causes upper respiratory symptoms and conjunctivitis in particular, it's not all that rare to see men with, with uh, urethritis who also have pink eye and they probably have adenovirus. Goes away, doesn't need treatment. Uh, it goes away harmlessly uh, in a couple of weeks. Oral Normal oral flora might explain some cases of NGU following insertive oral sex. It, it, it is likely that the urethra sometimes accommodates with an inflammatory response on reaction to an unfamiliar bacterial flora, but not really an STD pathogen. Uh, a clinical dilemma is, do the partners of men with non-pathogenic associated NGU uh, following oral sex, do those partners require treatment? You know, usually we do it because we don't know what else to do, but there's no evidence whatsoever that it prevents recurrent infections in the men or treats anything important in the partners. Just note also, and this is a confusing thing for patients in particular, particularly in this modern era when so many people are going to labs and seeking comprehensive STI testing uh, without your or a clinician's uh, input and advice. And they say, well, I don't have anything, I don't have an STI because all my tests were negative, but I have this discharge. 
The fact is that about half of all NGU has unknown and with current methods, unknowable etiology. Some of them might be tracing inflammatory responses to new but normal flora, which doesn't have to be oral. Uh, it's sort of interesting that clinically, my observation is I see NGU much more in men who have new sexual partnerships who are casual and new than I do in men who are resuming sex with a former regular partner. I, I think that probably some of these men are just adjusting microbiologically to an unfamiliar genital uh, flora. In some cases might not be infected at all. Um, treatment for NGU when you don't know the specific etiology. Uh, if it's an initial episode, not part of the recurrence pattern, doxy or azithromycin are equally effective although doxy is preferred <laughs> because uh, A, it is better for chlamydia, as we said, although not so important in men as in women. Uh, but also, if it turns out they that does persist or recur, you've already given the first half of your follow-up treatment in case they have mycoplasma genitalia. So I'd use doxy as the first choice, as this device in the second. Uh, if it does persist or recur, Two weeks later, they still got discharge, or a month later, it recurs, and they haven't had sex again uh, with, an un with an infected partner and so on. Then give the opposite. Whatever you gave first, give the other one this time. They had doxy first time, give them azithro, and vice versa. Uh, and this is where testing for M. genitalium uh, often makes sense, including azithromycin susceptibility. If it's available to you, you can check with your local labs. And as we said before, if they have M. genitalium, doxy, followed by moxifloxacin is the way to go. Syphilis. I used, uh, until a few years ago, syphilis was a topic I would go through only for people caring for men having sex with men. It was otherwise so uncommon in the U.S. We didn't worry about it. Remarkable resurgence now. In my jurisdiction, I used to direct the STD control program in uh, King County, uh, Washington, uh, in uh, in the mid-1990s, effective HIV treatment was introduced, and this is what happened to uh, syphilis in men having sex with men after that, with changes in behavioral therapy, and in women, it's now doing that. Now, do notice the scale is very different. On the left side of the slide, the rate per 100,000 MSM is much higher, much a different rate than the one on the right side for women, but the accelerating rate in women is having its uh, significant effect, and this is no longer as much of a problem limited heavily to MSM as it was a decade or two ago. Uh, it's very widespread uh, around the uh, uh, around the country. This shows the higher rates of the darker blue uh, in all U.S. counties, and uh, because many of you are at Cherokee Health, I threw up uh, the Tennessee map. Uh, as well, showing uh, where the infection is uh, is most common, and I think, although I'm not highly familiar with uh, with Tennessee geography at a personal level, I think you'll see the darker uh, areas uh, fo uh, focused around various uh, urban uh, 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 locations in your state. So, uh, this is what's happening with congenital syphilis. It's the single most devastating and important outcome of uh, of syphilis, and through all of my professional career, from its start in the 1970s up until the time I retired as director of public health Seattle, King County, I never saw a case of congenital syphilis. It was essentially absent in King County and certainly uh, absent in most areas of the country. It is a big deal. It is coming back. It's killing babies. And uh, the bottom line take home is there is no pregnant woman ever who crosses your door who does not get a syphilis screening test, and in some populations, repeatedly. Please. <clears throat> some issues to keep in mind that cross all aspects of syphilis <clears throat> epidemiology and management. I'll show you some pictures to make this point, but atypical clinical presentations are common. Be prepared to be aware of and worry about syphilis, even in cases that don't look like it in terms of, of uh, what you might do. Uh, clinically expect. Have a low threshold to consider neurosyphilis. I'm not going to talk in detail about neurosyphilis and ocular and otologic syphilis. 
However, uh, be aware that neurosyphilis and ocular changes are not properly considered tertiary syphilis. Neurosyphilis overlaps all stages of syphilis and is actually most common in people with syphilis under a year in duration. Not a tertiary manifestation, it's a manifestation that overlaps all the other stages of syphilis. I've already stressed the importance of screening pregnant women. I could spend a full 10 minutes on serological testing because there is confusion about the historically traditional algorithm. You start with an RPR or VRL and confirm with a T-palatin specific test versus what's called the reverse algorithm starting with a one of the newer T-palatin specific tests and then doing the RPR or VRL. It can be confusing in terms of interpreting the results, uh, but I'm not going to try to cover those details at this particular moment. Uh, but uh, uh, just be aware that for the most part, the results are pretty straightforward. If they're not, talk with your local ID or consult, and, uh, uh, and the exceptions can be confusing. My bottom bullet there, I would say, is a, not a bad advice. I think syphilis is sufficiently complex and it's nuanced in its presentations and its management that just about all cases, you probably should get an ID consult or talk with other certified experts, at least by a phone consult, if not with an in-person uh, referral. So that's the classic shaker. Two of them is not typical, but the appearance of the sort of indurated lesions and not very purulent, that's a, those are, that's a classic uh, penile shanker. Uh, these are classic pictures. You've been shown pictures like this since you were in medical or PA and nursing practice or nurse practitioner training. Uh, and uh, and you, I'm sure none of you would hesitate to uh, do a syphilis serology in people who presented uh, in the fashion. The fellow on the lower right had some interesting papulous squamous lesions of the penis and of the palms. Both are typical manifestations of secondary syphilis. Uh, but the secondary syphilis rash can be very subtle. Those very faint macules were in a woman with a skin rash of secondary syphilis. She had a, a, several others as well. But if she hadn't noticed the red spots and brought them to my attention, I would not have had a clue that there was anything wrong. Low threshold for testing. Uh, remember condyloma telata, the, the, uh, the flat warts, quote unquote, that, uh, that syphilis uh, uh, can cause. I haven't been using my arrow to point stuff, but this lesion, uh, uh, this rounded, smooth lesion are not HPV, but they're the flat warts of secondary syphilis. A little confusing. Anybody see the other STI that this patient has? It's got perianal recurrent herpes. See that little ulcer there? And these ulcers down here? So she had both those STIs. But the point is to recognize and be aware of the not uncommon, but recognizable lesions of condyloma delata. Mucus patches in the mouth, totally asymptomatic. You got to look in order to see them. Um, syphilis can mimic other rashes. This is a classic picture of eczema of the penis or of scabies, but it was secondary syphilis. Another picture, this is on the buttock of a woman who came to our clinic. She had eczema, except it was syphilis. Uh, be aware of the rare manifestation of malignant syphilis, or Louis maligna, if you still like Latin medical terminology. <clears throat> it tends to occur in early syphilis, not gamma late syphilis, but aggressive, badly, seriously ulcerative lesions. The main point is, if someone has the least sexual activity risk that puts them at risk for any STI, low threshold for syphilis screening, especially in light of uh, in atypical manifestations, and especially in light of the rising epidemiology of syphilis uh, everywhere. I'm not going to discuss syphilis treatment in detail. It's straightforward. Benzathine penicillin G, long-acting form of benzathine, uh, penicillin, is the drug of choice, has been for years, isn't changing. One dose for early syphilis, three doses for later syphilis. Pretty easy and straightforward. But there is a national sh shortage of benzathine penicillin G, bison. And if, if, if it is in short supply in your geographic area, CDC says go to Doxy as your drug of choice if you believe your patient is sufficiently with it 
to comply with 14 days treatment uh, and save the doxy, save the the BIC, the bicell, the benzathine penicillin G for those people who really are not going to be compliant. Uh, doxycycline is extraordinarily effective. Uh, uh, in fact, it's effective in some cases that don't fail to, uh, that, that don't respond to penicillin. Uh, so keep it in mind as a, as a higher priority choice for syphilis treatment than it has historically been advised in the past. Um, okay, off of syphilis to vaginal discharge syndrome, BV, trick, vulvovaginal yeast infections. Um, BV, complex biology, increasingly understood, still controversial as to whether it should be classified or considered an STI. It is unequivocally sexually transmitted among lesbian women. Research shows that among regular female pairs, if one has BV, the other always has BV. There are virtually no exceptions. They share vaginal secretions through fans, sex toys, and, and that's sort of the and direct apposition of the genitals. And, uh, and so it, it is clearly and unequivocally sexually transmitted in, in women who have sex with women. There is a clear association in heterosexual women of sex with new partners and onset of BV, which makes it act like an STI. On the other hand, treating the male partners has made no difference so far in various studies and drugs, and nobody's found a syndrome or bacteria in those male partners, which seems to explain the BV in the women. So conflicting evidence as to whether it's, uh, and I would, I my, my now deceased beloved colleague, Walter Stan, uh, used to call it an, a sad SAD, a sexually associated disease. Uh, how sad, he would say, uh, uh, for, uh, for the BV. Um, the, the, the initial pathology probably is depletion of lactobacillus uh, species, which are protective in terms of pH and, uh, and other aspects. But as lactobacilli fade from the vagina, other bacteria polymicrobial bacteria, largely anaerobic and gardnerial vaginalis overgrow, but those are not necessarily the primary cause of the organism. Um, primary symptoms of problems, vaginal odor is the consistent main symptom, often described as fishy, often enhanced after unprotected sex. Why? Because the, the uh, odor is produced by anaerobic bacterial metabolism. Uh, the when you hear the names of the compounds that are that produce that material, you'll never forget them because they're called cadaverine and putrescine. Who's ever going to forget those once you know them? They are volatilized by an alkaline environment, which is why the sniff test works. You add potassium hydroxide and you sniff because the alkalinization volatilizes those amines. Well, semen is also alkaline, and therefore. BV odor is often most prominent after sex. Microscopy, microscopically, these show the typical clue cells. If you're doing microscopy in, in your clinic, there are, as you probably are aware, there are several uh, other tests now approved in symptomatic patients uh, uh, to detect various organs associated with BV. Uh, they detect uh, Gardnerella vaginalis, for example, although Gardnerella is not per se, the cause of BV, it almost always overgrows in BV, and therefore a positive test is helpful in diagnosis. Um, treatment, metronidazole for seven days. Metronidazole vaginal gel also is effective, and clindamycin vaginal cream is as well. So are boric acid capsules. Uh, newer alternatives that are coming on the market, uh, including secnidazole, a trade name Solasec, are also potentially useful. And so far, it looks like secnitazole, this new drug, is effective as a single dose, uh, whereas metronidazole requires, flagell requires a seven days treatment. Um, treatment of, uh, uh, and before, I, you know, I'm not, not going to talk about trichomonas except treatment. Pretty straightforward to diagnose, although you should be using PCR tests uh, rather than relying on microscopy, uh, because Wet prep misses a high proportion of cases, more than half in most settings. Uh, 
main change in the CDC guidelines uh, recently is that you do need to give uh, seven days of metronidazole to cure trick. Two grams fails to cure 20 to 30% of infected women. Uh, it's still recommended a single dose two gram for males, uh, but they're not, not good supportive data on that, but that's what you what, what CDC recommends for the uh, uh, infected partners. And expedited partner therapy, although primarily a strategy for gonorrhea and chlamydia, certainly is reasonable uh, for, uh, for male uh, partners of infected women. Tinidazole, newer drug called uh, trade name Tindamax, does still seem to work as a two gram single dose. Uh, now, here's a major take home that's still not understood very well. There has never been any scientific evidence that alcohol does not mix with metronidazole. That was all an ephemera. There was never any research that, that did it. There has been evidence reviews showing uh, uh, nothing wrong. Uh, and uh, the, the metabolite of metronidazole that has been said to inhibit acid aldehyde dehydrogenase, which is the mechanism by which disulfiram and abuse induces nausea in the presence of alcohol, does not apply to this drug, in spite of everything you've heard and read. CDC now formally recommends, don't worry about alcohol when you give metronidazole. Uh, and in personal experience, the last bullet down there, uh, in my clinic, uh, we stopped worrying about that 30 years ago, and we never saw a problem in, in people whom we give metronidazole who later had an alcohol vomiting issue. Doesn't happen. Um, candidiasis is not sexually transmitted, although some people who are incubating an infection or with overgrowth may have symptoms triggered by the physicality of sex, but they're not acquiring this organism as an STI. New infection is generally in women not due to acquisition of previously non-existent candida, but rather overgrowth of normal candida that have been present there all the time and or introduction of candida into the vagina from the rectum because fecal and intestinal carriage of candida is an entirely normal physiologic phenomenon in all, in all human beings some of the time and uh, uh, many human beings all the time. Uh, there are a whole bunch of recommended treatments you're aware of them, and you've used them, I'm sure. But do be aware that when women are interviewed about efficacy of treatment and what they liked best, they generally preferred single-dose oral fluconazole, like diflucan, over vaginal creams that had to be taken for several days and uh, so on. So it's, you know, it's what we use in my clinic as the default treatment uh, most of the time. Be aware that a good 10% of candida species causing vaginal yeast infections are resistant to all the azoles. Uh, and, uh, and so it's not all that rare for people to take an azole, not get much better. And you can, if you want to be scientifically precise and compulsive, you can send it off for culture and have antimicrobial susceptibility testing done. Uh, and there are drugs listed at the bottom of the slide that can work. Uh, but you can also just go to one of those drugs or boric acid vaginal capsules. The details of how to prep them and the dose are in the CDC guidelines, but boric, vaginal boric acid is highly effective against candida, regardless of any microbial resistance in those yeasts. Herpes, giant topic out of some. After syphilis, it is arguably the most complex and complicated STI because of the nuances of the immune response, clinical manifestations, transmission, that sort of thing. I'm going to buzz through some a few principles very fast, um, uh, uh, but someday, somewhere along, if you like this talk, put in for me to give a spend a whole hour on genital herpes. It's pretty. It's a pretty fun disease to cover and pretty important to cover in uh, for most uh, clinicians who who frequently see patients at risk for STI. Um, first episode infection is either primary or non-primary. The prim primary infection is one's first exposure, first infection with either of the two main HSV types. Non-primary first episode is someone who's got now their first, usually HSV2 genitally, who previously had an oral HSV1 infection with and without symptoms. Non-primary first episode infections are a lot milder 
than true primary infections. Um, a lot of people whose first symptoms are actually having, have had long-standing infection and previously have mild recurrences they didn't notice, uh, but uh, really were there anyway. And so it's first episode of, uh, it was actually a long, first recognized episode of long-standing infection. Be aware that subclinical infection without symptoms is the majority of all HSV infections, whether genital or oral. You're not going to miss a case like this. There's primary. Here's here's typical severe primary herpes in a uh, in a woman with multiple ulcerative lesions uh, and nothing but herpes. Is like a rare, you know, Stevens Johnson syndrome and some others. But until proven otherwise, someone presenting like this has herpes. Primary, recurrent herpes tends to be more localized, clustered, and on dry surfaces will often present with the classical vesicles like this. But this lesion here, that's pretty small and might not be almost noticed by the patient, also is actually more typical as a recurrent lesion. This woman also has what might be thought of as a traumatic-looking fissure at the posterior foreshep. But both of these spots tested positive for HSV2. Uh, be aware that HSV1 and HSV2 cause very different clinical syndromes uh, when they infect the genital area. First of all, the two viruses are actually not as closely related as their names, herpes simplex virus being identical, might make you think. They actually have different evolutionary pathways, different dates back in human evolution, probably in the 10,000 to 30,000 years ago when they were introduced into human populations or proto-human populations from original animal reservoirs but they came in at different times, in different settings, even though they're related, they're not as closely related as you might think. They have very different clinical courses, especially in genital area. HSV2, far more commonly than HSV1, causes recurrence frequency, average recurrence frequency. In a person who has a symptomatic first episode of genital HSV2 infection, the average recurrence is about five to eight times a year over the next one to two years. The average frequency for your HSV-1 is one or two outbreaks in the next two to three years, and that's all. Half of all people with genital HSV-1 never have recurrence. Uh, so the recurrence frequency is far higher than HSV-2. Asymptomatic shedding is far higher than in HSV-1, and therefore the transmission to risk to partners is far higher. Most herpes experts say they have never, ever seen a genital herpes due to HSV-1 transmitted by genital-genital sex. Every case of genital HSV-1 follows oral sex, oral contact with that person. I'm sure there are exceptions, but they're rare enough that busy clinics virtually never see them. Um, the take home from that is that genital HSV-1 almost never requires suppressive therapy, whereas genital HSV-2 always should discuss at least and offer the option for suppressive therapy on an ongoing basis. The other clinical take home is there should be no patient with genital herpes that you ever see who does not somewhere along the line have the virus type tested. Please don't tell people, as sometimes happens, that oh, herpes is herpes, doesn't matter what type you have, uh, so don't worry about it. You want to know the type because it's gonna determine what you tell them about recurrent frequency to expect, what you tell them about the risk to partners, and what you consider in terms of suppressive therapy. Um, so treat all cases of primary herpes. They come in, a, a woman like the picture I showed, obviously you're gonna treat that person and you're not gonna wait for your culture result. Uh, you're gonna start treating right away. The drugs are totally benign. You can't hurt anybody by giving valacyclovir or acyclovir, even if you don't yet know for sure it's uh, herpes. Obviously they're already getting better maybe you hold off, but most people you ought to uh, plan on treating. Valacyclovir, a gram twice daily is what I usually use, but acyclovir and famcyclovir also work. By the way, in case you're not aware, the name val acyclovir tells you a lot about the drug. It is acyclovir with a valine molecule, the amino acid valine uh, added to it. It increases absorption out of the GI tract. As it is absorbed, the valacycline is cleaved off. 
So the circulating active ingredient with valacyclovir is just good old acyclovir. You just have a more efficient way to get higher doses of drug into the bloodstream. The other take home on that is if you're treating someone with acyclovir and they're not responding as promptly as you wish, switch them to valve. Double the dose of acyclovir or switch into valve. It's you get more drug into the blood with uh, less frequent dosing than you do with acyclovir itself. Um, so I already alluded to suppressive therapy of genital HSV2. I would always discuss and offer the option to just about everybody, but a number of episodes alone is not the issue. Uh, shared decision-making is indicated here in people with frequent recurrent lesions. It does improve quality of life, but you need to reassess the need periodically. Some people, even without such frequent recurrences, like having them less frequently and have a psychological benefit of being treated. Uh, it, and it does help prevent uh, uh, transmission. You, you, you can't give enough acyclovir or valacyclovir to a human being to make them sick. It is an extremely benign drug. These are extremely benign drugs. And uh, you don't really need to worry about important side effects or that sort of thing uh, for, for all practical purposes. So there's no strong reason not for them not to be taken on an ongoing basis. On the other hand, uh, intermittent suppressive therapy might make sense. Hey, doc, I'm going on my, I'm going on a, a, a singles cruise. And, uh, you know, what I don't want is have to worry as much about herpes during the next two months as I normally do. Suppressive therapy might be useful. Um, uh, the regimens, a little bit of variation in terms of doses, but here's the usual. Valacyclovir once a day a higher dose of a whole gram if they're having frequent occurrences, 500 once a day is enough if they're having less frequent ones, or valacyclovir or acyclovir or Um Topical anti-HSV treatment is not much better than placebo. I never, I never prescribe it. If someone's using it and they think it helps and they want to refill, of course, but I don't, not, 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 not treatment I regularly initiate in patients. Um, and what about the kinds of stuff you'll see online and elsewhere and in our social rubric, uh, stress, diet, natural remedies, and so on. There is no clear biological basis. There are no studies that in fact show uh, that HSV recurrent outbreaks have anything to do with psychological stress, uh, lack of sleep, or that sort of thing. Now, I can't prove that that doesn't happen sometimes. And if someone reports that activity X or stress Y uh, regularly triggers their outbreaks, sure, support them and saying, okay, let's do what we can to avoid those episodes. But don't go telling people to look for stress, stressful events and then eliminate them. And so, so number one, how good are you at eliminating stress in your life? Say, oh, I, you know, I get nervous before I have an exam and, uh, and therefore I'm not going to take exams. <laughs> it's not a very big, not very good, doesn't work very well. Obviously, avoid obvious triggers if he's identified, but rely on antiviral therapy, not on psychological medicine. I'm going to close with a, with, and hopefully still, it looks like I might be successful leaving seven or eight minutes for a discussion about the newest thing, in quotes, on STI prevention of which you need to be aware. And that is doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis, uh, doxypep for STI prevention. Um, so what is it? Who indicated for, and I'll show you a little bit of data very quickly, I'll blast through some studies showing some of the things I'm going to show you. But uh, uh, this is the concept of giving doxycycline in a single 200 milligram dose within 72 hours of high risk exposure. So far, advice, and by the way, CDC is going to have, CDC has a has a statement on doxyprep approving and advising its routine use nationwide going through clearance process in CDC as we speak. The CDC clearance process is bureaucratic and slow. It might be a few months, but before the summer, you're going to see a CDC proposed CDC recommendation added to the STI treatment advice uh, of doxy, doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis for men who have sex with men and transgender women. It prevents, it is highly effective in preventing chlamydia and syphilis, and it's about 50% protective in preventing gonorrhea, 
And that's because many gonorrhea strains are tetracycline resistant, but others are highly susceptible. So a single 200 milligram dose within 72 hours is prescribed for your patients, several doses, shared decision-making, how, how often will you have such exposures? What's a high-risk exposure mean? I'm not going to go into detail on that. There are papers you can look at, and the CDC guidance will have details. But unprotected anal sex with an unknown or new partner would be a high, would be an obvious one. Anybody who's recently had other STIs, syphilis, chlamydia, gonorrhea, monkeypox, et cetera, and has unprotected sex with other men, uh, and this includes transgender women who may anatomically still have male genitalia, but are transgender uh, women uh, should be put in the same pigeonhole as MSM for this uh, purpose. Now, what's interesting is that the guidelines so far and the initiatives will only address MSM. And so one can reasonably ask to paraphrase uh, Dolly Madison in her, uh, 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 or excuse me, Abigail Adams in her commentary with her husband, John, in the, uh, in the Declaration of Independence and Early Constitution Days, uh, please don't forget the ladies. Uh, interestingly, extremely high quality research showed zero effect in presenting, preventing either chlamydia or syphilis in 440 women in Kenya. However, in retrospect, the investigators who conducted that study, who are my colleagues at the University of Washington in Seattle, are highly suspicious that because of counseling issues or others, the women were skeptical. Turns out in post-study interviews, there were a large number of them who are skeptical about Western antibiotics in general and don't like taking antibiotics, which wasn't known to the investigators when they enrolled them in the study, uh, which is too bad, but it didn't work. More studies are underway. I think there probably are some women you will see who probably would benefit from doxypep depending on the clinical situation and, uh, and that sort of thing. If someone's a known sexual contact or someone got a rare you're going to treat them for that anyway. But if someone is, uh, has a, a particular kinds of especially high risk, they've had it before, uh, I, I can't say that I could condemn its use, even though it will not be recommended in the first round of CDC guidelines. Here are the results in one of the strong studies showing the rates of new chlamydia redline or new syphilis redline or in, in excuse me, redline in those who got doxy, blue uh, redline in those who got placebo, blue line in those who got uh, 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 doxycycline. Similar results in the United States uh, in MSM to cl for chlamydia infection and for syphilis. Um, and those are the studies. And here are the data showing no such change no, no association, the colored lines overlap each other uh, in the uh, 440 women study in Kenya. Uh, so documented benefits, reduced STIs by at least 60%, uh, probably 90% most of the time, uh, prevented them all, safe and well tolerated, high, high adherence and uh, acceptability. And, um, but there are potential risks. And over the years, you're gonna see studies that might end up modifying the guidelines. How important will it be on inducing in inducing resistance to the tetracyclines in these organisms? So far, not much effect in the studies done so far. And the fact is that we don't really know that STI treatment is what drives STI antimicrobial resistance. General antibiotic use in the population might be a more important driver for gonorrhea and antimicrobial resistance than is gonorrhea treatment per se. Other potential adverse effects, but so far the general consensus and the experts is the benefits are going to greatly outweigh the risks. Uh, so I want, I've want i told you about the implementation status. Some health departments have, uh, uh, have um, uh, are already making recommendations as in this case on the right side I've summarized the San Francisco ones my former jurisdiction, Seattle King County, has guidelines out. Other state public health agencies and so on are doing so. I don't know the status currently. For those of you at Cherokee Health, I don't know the status in Tennessee at this uh, particular moment. But the CDC guidance will be out pretty soon. So that's those are all my prepared comments. I appreciate your attention. 
We have a few minutes for Q and A. Uh, I'm just going to put up again as we start Q and A the QR codes again if anybody wants to uh, uh, have quick access to the PDF versions of the um, of the latest CDC uh, published CDC advice on these issues. Uh, by the way, I'll make one other comment about the CDC guidance. I should have, I could have mentioned earlier. Up until now, every four to five years, CDC has called together a colloquium. A couple hundred experts come into town. Uh, I've been involved in every single one of those beginning in the 1980s, uh, and I've enjoyed it, but it's coming to an end because instead of a spastic, let's change everything at once every few years, there's going to be an ongoing iteration. As new developments develop, individual problems and diseases we can consider on a case-by-case -case basis and the guidelines modified on a more real-time basis, disease by disease and population by population as years go on. So look for MMWR or notices saying there is a modification of the guidelines on, might be chlamydia and MSM, it might be treatment of trichomonas, it might just keep your eye out for that sort of thing as opposed to a whole new box of recommendations every several years. Thank you for your attention. I'm open for uh, for uh, 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 for uh, uh, discussion and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hansfeld. I want to first say there are so many comments in the chat and the Q&A that said, thank you, this is a great presentation. And I agree. Um, so we have a few minutes. So I'll get to as many questions as I can. First mm -hmm. was in a chat. Would you, um, like, would you like me to look at the chat or do you think it's best if you just moderate? Because there might be duplicates and that sort of thing. Yeah, you know what? Is there? You, yeah. <laughs> if, if I'll... I'll tell you what, I'll go through the chat questions. If you want to take a look at the Q&A questions, there's a lot of them. Okay. Um, so we'll see what we can do. Let's start with this one, though. Um, yeah. This is a, a patient in his mid-40s with enlarged adrenal, adrenal life, lymph nodes, I swear I know words, that are firm, and he's got night sweats and about 15 pounds weight loss recently. The plan is to get a lymph node biopsy and send for pathology and AFB stains. What other tests should be done? Um, I, I would say let's not take too much time on this because although I appreciate you, and by the way, anybody can email me with any questions like this, clinical manager, or I'm a very simple email address. My initials, HHH, <laughs> W for University of Washington, dot edu. So HHH at UUW dot, uh, uh, dot edu. Uh, I would say the, the most First thing I would say about that particular patient is I would bet an STI is less likely than our other non-STI syndromes for this sort of thing. Although certain STIs, lymphoglobinum, venereum, and syphilis certainly are in the category. If he's not been worked up for syphilis, by all means, do that. Okay. And also, you can always submit an e-consult to Dr. Hansfield. But, you know, so you know, actually, in, in recognition of that's actually the preferred yes. mechanism. <laughs> if you just go to... Uh, 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 you, use your Maven connection and go to an e-consult. Uh, you can get me that way too. And you can either request an ID consult in general or an ID slash STD consult. And there are others who can pick it up if I'm not available or I'm, I, I, I am happy to see them uh, uh, directed specifically to me if you want to do that. Okay, I'm going to just look for questions that have nothing to do with patients right now, just overall questions. Um, do you routinely add HSV blood testing for patients requesting STI testing? Not necessarily. The HSV, the, 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 that's another topic we can go into much more detail with a herpes only presentation. But the blood tests are not good enough to be, to be they just they can give misleading results in a lot of situations. I would rarely view it as just routine STI screening. I would limit serological testing primarily to those of clinical syndromes that suggest recurrent herpes, or they have an episode that sounds like it was likely the primary initial herpes, but it's now two months further on, and virologic testing by PCR wasn't done, uh, serology can help sort out whether that person now has an HSV-2 uh, infection, for example. Someone has a history of recurrent genital sores and hasn't timed one of those outbreaks at a time they can be tested lesions by PCR, a diagnostic positive for HSV2 can be helpful. But in people without symptoms and not, and also the, the regular, not one time, 
the regular sex partners of people, the spouses of someone with known genital HSV too, maybe. But outside those settings, there are just too many false positives, too many false negatives and difficulties in interpretation that I would in general avoid it. And that's why you don't see uh, HSV serological testing as part of the routine recommendations from CDC, WHO, and other uh, agencies. Are all of the PEP studies on unprotected intercourse only, or is there value after intercourse in which barriers were used as well? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I followed the context. Uh, so, uh, it is from our good friend. Uh, it's the last Q and A, and from Dr. Carmack. The Q and A. Uh, yeah, all the way at the bottom. Oh, are all PEP studies on um, um Certainly, the uh, the real world played a role here, and for uh, and, and I would say yes, even with protected sex, there often is a role. Although I think this is part of the shared decision-making uncertain aspects. When the studies of doxypep were done, and for the most part, I think it's true when the studies of, of uh, HIV post-exposure prophylaxis were done, for obvious ethical reasons, participants had to be told to take precautions. We don't, we're not encouraging you to go out there and intentionally put yourself at risk just because you're on our study. Yes, you should use condoms. Yes, you should carefully select the place you pick partners and what you believe their part, your partner's risk should be. So they were all given that counseling. So some of the infections undoubtedly occurred despite condom protection, that sort of thing. Still, condoms are highly effective for any one exposure, uh, even if over time they're never perfect in STI prevention. So if someone uh, consistently uses condoms for anal sex in a bathhouse situation, for example, um, and has never had gonorrhea or syphilis, I basically say, you know, you probably don't need it. On the other hand, if they occasionally have a lapse or if they've recently shown the evidence of their patent high risk because they've had a bacterial STI, like past syphilis, chlamydia, or gonorrhea, then I'd lower the threshold. Um, it, again, the, the, the research data don't translate to unequivocal black-white decisions for any one patient for the most part. You need to talk it through and have a little bit of insight and seek the patient's insight as to what they really need. Can the syphilis rashes be itchy or ever be vascular? Can be itchy. Uh, most most are not, but but uh, pruritus per se does not rule out syphilis for the most part. Okay. So I'm trying to make sure that we're getting like, the best questions. I know I've run over. So, um, I'm gonna, if I can hit just a couple I see. So yeah. someone asked, isn't the immune system what keeps HSV check? In fact, I think I recognize uh, that name. Greetings to you. There have been a couple of, uh, of Maven STI consults with this uh, uh, clinician. It's nice to see you uh, on the program. Uh, isn't the immune system that keeps HSV in check so anything that decreases its function trigger an outbreak? No, the immune system is, is highly complex and not all immune insults are the same. So there, there are... Uh, certainly cellular immune insults like HIV clearly increase the frequency of subclinical shedding and outbreaks of either oral or genital herpes. But people on infliximab or Humira or, uh, or other drugs, and most people on cancer chemotherapy don't get increased recurrences. And for most particular immunosuppressive regimens, there's no exact data one way or the other. So I would tell anybody who you know is in the art uh, to be on the alert for increased frequency of, uh, of outbreaks, but I, wouldn't, uh, but I wouldn't tell them you are doomed to uh, have such an outcome. Um, so, uh, and, and by the same token, uh, I would not routinely uh, 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 treat every person with uh, herpes outbreaks with any with any uh, agents of drugs. All right. Others? Um, if you see anything in the Q&A box that you would like to answer, otherwise we will wrap up. We are, I don't know if they're. So the, uh, there's another question. If a woman has recurrent BV, 
and she thinks she gets it consistently after she ruins them sex with her male partner, uh, is might there be a role for treatment? Problem is, I don't know what to treat them with. And I would rather have, I would tell that couple, number one, first test the hypothesis. Does avoiding sex for a limited period, say six weeks, uh, prevent, or is this consistent condom use prevent that infection? Uh, if it does, and unprotected sex is important to these couples, I suppose it's not, would not be unreasonable to give a trial with a broad, broad spectrum antimicrobial like uh, doxycycline uh, or uh, conceivably a fluoroquinolone, uh, but these are not, as I say, the, the whether, whether you're actually going to do anything to actually prevent the case. Again, shared decision making, giving things a shot uh, might be sometimes worth a try. But there but is one question. I'm sorry. I missed this one question in the chat and I apologize. Um, follow up testing after treating syphilis. I guess what CDC, CDC advises uh, uh, follow up uh, less frequently than they used to. So six months, a year, and ideally out a couple years later. The definition of uh, cure after benzathine penicillin, the, the serological accepted definition is a twofold or greater decline in the RPR or VDRL titer at six months. So if you start at one to 16, a twofold decline takes you to one to four or lower. If you start at one to 128, twofold decline takes you to one to 32 or lower. The higher it is, however, the more of a decline you expect. So most people, even with 128 or 64, after six months will be down to one to two or one to four or something that's unequivocally. If someone has only a one to two decline in six months, I'd be a little bit nervous. And if somebody starts out low, if their initial titer is only one to four, then at six months, it might still be one to one, one to two, which is on the borderline. Uh, it, it is unfortunate and a frustrating fact of life that, that we don't have better measures of cure in syphilis. You've got the clinical, did the rash go away? Uh, did other manifestations go away if they were uh, present? Um, plus serological decline is all we usually have. There is active research going on looking at now that it's possible to cultivate trepidema pallidum in vitro, which was a generation sought research goal that was finally achieved uh, only uh, now uh, uh, five or eight years ago, uh, is going to translate, one hopes, into nucleic acid amplification testing for t palatin components or that sort of thing that might be better measures than serology. But so far, those are in vitro laboratory researches research going on and nothing that's been clinically uh, uh, clinically certified or available on a routine basis so far. All right. Dr. Hansfield, thank you for staying on 10 minutes later. Really appreciate it. Um, I know there's some questions left, but again, you can always reach out to Dr. Hansfield on, um, on our platform and he also shared his email address. Um, I just want to say that there was many, I'm reading the surveys that have come in. They want more sessions with Dr. Hansfield. So you're a hit. Uh, okay. Just a reminder to everybody that's still on that your CME survey is going to pop up. If for some reason you receive an error, we also receive the error. You don't have to resubmit it multiple times. We'll, we'll fix it, I promise. Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Dr. Hansfield. It's been a pleasure. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye. Nice weekend.